Hello and welcome to my Brothers Monikmus plot summary, by, um, it's a play by Plautus. If you have heard my Greek comedy summaries, then um, this is basically the same concept, I'm using the same colour scheme for annotations. Um, pink is historical context, purple is language um, analysis, blue is types of humour and green is other any other thing I really want to talk about. Um, I will say that Roman comedy, which is what Plautus is, um, is a lot less, there's a lot less to annotate with it, basically. It's a lot more simplistic. Um, it's less to do with current affairs. It's supposed to be more timeless, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm not as big a fan of it as I am of Greek. Um, but it's on my exam, and I'm assuming if you're listening to this, then it's on yours too. Um, so I have a cup of tea. I advise you get yourself one, and let's get going. So the prologue is a typical start to Roman comedy, and it's spoken by an unnamed character here. He welcomes the audience and asks them to listen to what Plautus has to say. He says that comedies usually take place in Athens, but this play breathes a Grecian air in Sicily. Um, so all of the action actually takes place in Epidamnus in Greece, however the backstory is in Italy. He then sets out the backstory of the play, which is in verse. A Syracusan merchant had identical twin sons. And the identical is emphasised here because it's very important for the, for the main plot. When they were seven, the, their father went to Tarentum on a business trip with one of the children, while the other was left at home with his mother. This is in Italy. Tarentum was en fête, so in a festival, and so there were massive crowds. The child was separated from his dad and taken to Epidamnus by an Epidamnian trader. The father was distraught and died in Tarentum a few days later. When the grandfather back in Syracuse heard news of this, he changed the name of the remaining brother after the lost one, turning his name from Sosicles to Monikmus, because he actually preferred the lost brother. And Monikmus was also the grandfather's name, which is significant. He then reminds the audience that the twins will both be called Monikmus when they show up. So basically, Roman comedy is very simplistic, the theatre was competing with other entertainments at the Ludi Romani festival, um, and so playwrights had to repeatedly remind the audience of the plot, which is why there are so many asides, so many little breaks in the in the in the story for it, the plot to be reminded again. Um, as I said, I I don't enjoy this as much, but it's it's what it is. It is it is a feature of Roman comedy. He takes a few steps, which is visual humour, to the side, and states that he moves to Epidamnus. He addresses the audience and asks if anyone has any commissions in Apidamnus, joking about money. Now he's back in prose. He points to the scenery and says that this is Epidamnus, as long as this play lasts anyway. In another play, it will be another place, I expect. So he's already breaking the fourth wall and shattering the theatrical illusion. Everyone, the audience, the actors, is very much aware that this is a play. They don't try to pretend that it's real life. Um, so there's a lot of breaking the fourth wall and talking directly to the audience. He continues the backstory, saying that the Epidamnian trader who stole Monikmus was childless, and so when he died, he gave the boy a wife and dowry and heritage. The trader died on a country walk on a stormy day, and so Monikmus adopted his large estate, which is where he lives today. Um, and the unnamed character points to the house on stage to show that this is Monikmus' house. He tells the audience to watch and says that they will soon see the Syracusan twin arrive with a slave in search of his brother and to find him. It's very ominous, isn't it? Um, so, backstory summarised. Two twins. One goes to Tarentum and gets taken away. His name was Monikmus. The other one who got left behind, his name is changed to Monikmus from Sosicles. Um... Now, the original Monikmus is living with an estate in Epidamnus, and the other twin, the new Monikmus, has come to find him. That's basically what's happening. Okay, the main plot. So, Paniculus, who is the stock character of the Parasitus, nicknamed the Sponge, um, this basically just means he's like a parasite, he's very into food, he will befriend anyone if they will give him food or money or things like that. Um... So he enters from the town, about to visit the house of Monikmus. In just to let you know, we're going to refer to the original Monikmus as Monikmus, and the other character, the other twin, as Sosicles, just to make it clearer who we're talking about. 
He introduces himself to the audience and explains that he is called Sponge because he wipes the table clean whenever, whenever he eats. He says that it is stupid to put prisoners in chains and put fetters on runaway slaves because they will always find a way to escape. The way to keep a man from running away is to give him as much food and drink as he wants. Food. It's a marvellously effective kind of straitjacket. The more you stretch it, the closer it clings. He claims that he is Malachmus' bond slave and is voluntarily in imprisonment because Malachmus is a great host and gives a huge banquet. In reality, he is Malachmus' client. This is the system of patronage in which the wealthy supported the poor in return for the poor doing things for them. And when I say poor, they're not actually very poor, they're just poorer than the other characters. And the only person in Rome who didn't have a client was the emperor. Paniculus says that there has been an intermission in food for a while now, and has had to buy his own food, which is very expensive, and this is why he is calling on Monachmus. He sees Monachmus coming out and hides in a corner. The Roman stage was shallow and long to allow for the common eavesdropping scenes in Roman comedy. Um, this is a typical motif, and uh, yeah, we're going to see it a lot, a lot. but the, basically the, the stage was built for this type of thing. Menachemus, the typical stock character of the Adolescans. He is a young man, and he appears at the door shouting at his wife. He says that if she weren't such a mean, stupid, obstinate and impossible female, she wouldn't want to do anything that he disliked, and he threatens to divorce her. This characterisation is typical of the stock Uxor character, Uxor meaning wife. Uh, it's interesting, the wife never gets a name, she's always referred to as Menachemus' wife, which is typical of the Uxor, just not really a main character, just there for annoying, to annoy her husband. <laughs> Every time he goes out of the door, she tries to stop him and asks him millions of questions. He says that he's spoiled her by providing her with servants, food, clothes and jewellery. And then he tells her to behave and stop spying on him. He says that if she wants something to spy on, he's going out with his mistress tonight. This shows the typical patriarchal society. We've got a man with a mistress and his wife can do nothing about it. And he is just allowed to have a mistress because that's the way things were. Aside, a common technique in Roman comedy, Paniculus says that he, sorry, that Menachemus is really harming him rather than the wife, because he is the one who will suffer if Menachemus isn't home for dinner. Menachemus addresses the audience, asking if the loving husbands are going to congratulate him on his heroic fight. He reveals that he's wearing one of his wife's gowns under his cloak, and says that he has stolen it to give to his mistress. This is visual humour. Let's say I filched some booty from the enemy. This is military language, which um, is common in comedy, for Ro in Roman comedy anyway. Paniculus asks if he gets a share of the booty. Malachmus hears, but doesn't see him, and wonders who else is spying on him. Paniculus says that he is protecting him, and then reveals himself. Malachmus calls him my old friend on the spot, and Mr. Come in Time, since his stereotyping and you know, the stock character. They greet each other, and Paniculus is very obsequious. Malachemus says that he couldn't have come at a more favourable moment, and Paniculus says that he is good at knowing when a favourable moment is near. Again, typical Paracetus. Malachemus asks if Paniculus has ever seen a mural pa painting of the eagle abducting Ganymede, or Venus seducing Adonis. Um, Ganymede was a handsome Trojan boy who Zeus abducted via eagle to be his cupbearer and Venus abducted an incredibly beautiful man known as Adonis. Paniculus says that he has, and then Monachus poses in his gown and asks if he looks anything like them. Paniculus asks why. Monachus tells him to say that Monachus is clever. He asks what they're going to eat, but Monachus insists. Um, insists that, that Paniculus says this, and so Paniculus does. He's very obedient. Monachus then asks for compliments, and Paniculus calls him amusing, but refuses to praise him any more until he knows what it's in aid of. He says he must tread carefully due to Monachmus' quarrel with his wife. Monachmus says that they are going to bury their troubles, and then the pair begin to leave. Monachmus criticises Paniculus for being too scared to turn his back on the house, but then Paniculus calls Monachmus a chariot racer because he keeps looking over his shoulder to see if the enemy is going, is gaining on him. Sorry, 
I've there's a lot of typos here. I I make these and I'm very tired, so <laughs> and I apologise, but I mean I'm gonna read it properly. Monac must ask Paniculus to smell the dress, offering it a skirt, but Paniculus would rather smell the top. He says it smells of stolen goods, secret amours, and a free lunch. This is farcical. Um, Monacma says that he is right. The gown is going to go to his mistress, Erotium, and they will all have lunch at her house. Her name literally means Miss Erotic, so it's an, a good pun. Paniculus asks if he should knock at the door, and Monacma says to knock gently. Paniculus says that the doors aren't made of Samnian pottery. This is a, a very posh and fragile thing, so it's like saying they aren't made of your best china, something like that. Erotium comes out and lovingly greets Monachmus. Paniculus asks for a welcome, but Erotium says that he doesn't count. Monachmus tells her that he's planned a party at her house. He and Paniculus will have a drinking battle, and whoever wins will be with her for the night. She will be umpire. He says that looking at her, he truly hates his wife. Erotium asks why Monachmus is wearing his wife's clothes, and he says that the dress is for her. Erotium says that this sets him above her other suitors. So this, she is the stock character of a meritrix, um, basically a prostitute, because she is sexually experienced and absolutely unashamed of it. She doesn't mind admitting that she's got other suitors that she sleeps with. Um, that's, she's probably one of the strongest women in this play. Paniculus, aside, says that it is just like her, to, um, just like her sort, to talk nicely when there is something to gain. He is stereotyping. Monachmus tells Paniculus to hold his cloak while he takes the gown off to give his lover. Monachmus says that he w that it was a great wish. I'm sorry, that it was a great risk stealing the dress, comparing it to Hercules stealing Hippolyta's girdle. This was the ninth labour of Hercules, um, and basically he had to get a girdle from the Amazon Hippolyta, which she was terrifying. The the Amazon women were amazing fighters and very scary. Um, so he's comparing his wife to this terrifying Amazon, basically. He says that it cost him 400 drachmas. And then aside, Paniculus says that was 400 down the drain. Monachmus asks Erotium to tell her people to prepare lunch for the three of them, to get them to buy something at the market, and she agrees. Monachmus says that they will go off to town and will be back soon to drink while it's cooking. She says that she will be ready for them when they return. They leave, and Erotium tells her cook, Cylindrus, um, his name means rolling pin, <laughs> to go to the market with three pounds to buy something to eat. He asks who's eating, and she says that it will be her, Monachmus, and his table companion. Selindra says that this is more like ten people, because table companions can eat for eight. She tells him to buy simply for three and to be quick, and he leaves. So this is the typical mercenary cook trying to get more money from her, um, and he is stereotyping the Parasitus character. Sosicles arrives at the harbour in Epidamnus with his slave, Mycenio, and other slaves carrying baggage. Mycenio asks why they have come to Epidamnus, and Sosicles says it is to search for his twin brother. Mycenio asks um, how long they will continue looking, because it has been six years and across the world, um, finding nothing, and so Monachmus must be dead. So Mycenio is the stock service Kalidus character, which is... Um, clever slave and Plautus gives a perhaps false window into slaves minds because obviously well actually there is a rumour that he was a slave a, a, like a freed slave himself um, but we don't know that so he may this may not be how slaves acted but this is what people thought they acted like um, and across the world this is obviously across the world known to the Romans at least for example the Danube Spain and Massilia Um, Sosicles says that if that is the case, he's looking for someone who has certain news about whether his brother is dead. Mycenio says that they may as well search for a knotted bulrush, and Sosicles tells him to do what he's told. So a bulrush is always straight, so this is impossible. It's a Grecian idiom. Obviously, the, um, Roman comedy was based on Greek new comedy, so a lot of the phrases and idioms are actually Greek in origin, and became Roman through Plautus. A 
side, Messenia says that this, is, this was to remind him that he's a slave. He turns to Sosocles and says that they are lacking in money. If they don't go home soon, they will be down to nothing. The people of Epidamnus are drunkards and debauchees, swindlers and seductive prostitutes. That's why it's called Epidamnus. Anyone that lands up here is doomed to damnation. This is verbal humour. Good old pun. Classic for um, Roman comedy. Sosicles asks for the purse because he doesn't trust Messenia with it. He is too fond of women and Sosicles has a quick temper so this will save them both. Cylindrus comes from the market and sees Sosicles and Messenia waiting outside. Uh, sorry, outside the door, thinking they are his guests. Thinking he is Menychmus, Cylindrus greets him. This is the first case of many of mistaken identity. So obviously Sosicles is one of the twins, Menychmus is the other. Everyone in Epidamnus knows Menychmus, but they see Sosicles and they're going to think he is Menychmus because they are identical. I mean, we obviously ignore the fact that they were probably wearing different clothes and, you know, might have had a different haircut or whatever, but this is all base, you know, very simplistic humour. We're not supposed to question it too much. Sosicles asks who he is, and Cylindrus is thinking he is making a joke. He asks where the other guests, table companions are, and Sosicles asks what he's talking about. Messenio says that Cylindrus is clearly a swindler. Sosicles asks who the table companion would be, and Cylindrus says the sponge. This is farce. Messenio says he has a sponge in the kit bag. Oh, so it's taking the, literally, um, again, farcical. Cylindrus says that they are a little early for lunch, and Sosicles thinks he is talking to a lunatic, and so gives Cylindrus two drachmas to go and sacrifice a pig. Cylindrus tells Sosicles his name, and is sure that he must recognise him. Sosicles says that he could be Cylindrus or Coriandus for all he cares. So Cylindrus means rolling pin in Greek, and Coriandus is a type of herb, so these are both cook humours. Cylindrus says that he knows Sosicles, his name is Menychmus. Obviously, because Sosicles has been called Menychmus since he was seven, um, Plautus only calls him Sosicles so that the play makes sense. So, accu actually, Sosicles is like, oh gosh, my name is Menychmus. Um, you know, that's what he's been called for this for this many years. Sosicles is, is surprised that Cylindrus knows his name and asks where they've met. Cylindrus is surprised and says that Sosicles is a Rotium's lover, but Sosicles denies it. The farce continues and Cylindrus asks whether Sosicles is the inhabitant of that house, pointing to Menychmus's, and Sosicles damns whoever lives there. Aside, Cylindrus says that Sosicles must be insane for cursing himself and then returns the two drachmas for Sosicles to make a sacrifice. A sacrificing a pig was supposedly to help you um, be cured for insanity. Cylindrus addresses the audience, saying that it is typical of Menychmus to make such jokes when, they, when he's away from his wife. So this is plot inconsistency. Cylindrus thinks he's insane, but also seems to think it's just a joke, so clearly it, he would think it's one or the other. But anyway, that's just Roman comedy. Cylindrus asks him if he thinks that there is enough food for the three of them, and the questions about who the table companion and lady are begin again. Messenio interjects, trying to stop Cylindrus from pestering his master, but Cylindrus disregards him. Cylindrus asks Sosicles' leave to begin cooking, and Sosicles says, You have my leave to go and be hanged. Cylindrus goes in and says that he will send out a rotium. Sosicles tells Messenio that his warnings about Ep Epidamnus were valid. Messenio suggests that the whore might live in this house, telling him to be careful. Sosicles is still astounded that Cylindrus knew his name. Messenio says that it isn't extraordinary. Prostitutes send their slaves to the port to find out the identity of any foreigners so that they can be manipulated for money. He says that there is a pirate ship in that port at this moment, meaning a Rotium's house. This is a nautical metaphor which would be relatable for quite a lot of the audience. They hide in the corner, and the door opens. Erotium arrives at the door, talking to someone within. She tells them to leave the door open, spreads the couches, um, and burn some perfumes, because gentlemen spend more money if they are comfortable. She sees Sosicles. Now we have the second case of mistaken identity. And she asks him why he's standing in the street, when the door is wide open for him. She says that they have everything he ordered, and lunch is ready. Sosicles asks who she's talking to, and she says him, of course. He asks what she has to do with him, and she says that she must honour him above all other men. 
Sosicles tells Messenio that Erotium must be insane or drunk because he's never met her before. Messenio says that she is just a harlot trying to get money from him. Messenio asks Erotium where she's seen Sosicles before, and she says in Epidamnus. Messenio says that he's never before been to Epidamnus, and Erotium laughs, saying, Won't you come in, Menachemus darling? Sosicles is so shocked that she knows his name, but Messenio says it is just for money. So Sosicles gives him the purse to find out if that if it's that she's really in love with. Erotium invites him to lunch, and he asks to be excused. She wonders why he asked her to cook a lunch an hour ago, and he says that he didn't. And then there is more farce about the whole table companion thing. It goes on for quite a while. Erotium says that he gave her his wife's dress, and Sosicles says that she must be dreaming on her feet like a horse. Sosicles says that he doesn't have a wife. He has never before come to Epidamnus and already had a lunch on board the ship. Erotium thinks he must be mad and asks what he means by a ship, and he explains simplistically. Well, it's a sort of wooden affair. She tells him to stop joking, but Sosicle says that she must be looking for someone else. Erotium says that she knows him. He is Menychmus, son of Motius, born in Sicily, which was ruled by Agathocles, then Phintius, then Liparo, and now Hero. So this is correct, which suggests that the abducted Menychmus knew about his real genealogy. Um, obviously, Erotium would only know this if Menychmus, the, the kidnapped Menychmus, was able to tell her it. So this begs the question, why did he not go and search for his family if he knew exactly where they were? Perhaps he's actually happy in Epidamnus without them. Um, again, though, this isn't really touched upon. Um, this uh, line of um, rulers is factually incorrect, but it's generally unimportant in Roman comedy anyway. Um, Sotocle says that she is correct, and Messenio wonders whether she came from Sicily, because she knows so much about him. Sotocle says that he doesn't think he can keep refusing her invitation, but Messenio says he's done for it if he enters the house. Sosicles tells him to shut up and decides to go along with everything she says in return for a little hospitality. So the, they're very subtle in innuendos, um, and it's the most vulgar humour really gets in Roman comedy, um, compared to Greek comedy, which is very much explicitly talking about just everything. Um, throwback to Lysistrata, where it's the lioness on a cheese grater position is referred to. In Roman comedy, it's a lot more subtle um sex is is there it's part of the joke but it's it's like you know a little hospitality rather than let's have sex right now kind of thing <laughs> Sosicles tells Erotium that the reason he contradicted her about his identity was because he didn't want Messenio to tell his wife about their lunch party and the dress she asks if he's going to wait for his friend but he tells her that even if that man does arrive he should be turned away at the door obviously this is because Sosicles knows that whoever this table companion is won't, they, you know, they're not going to know each other. She now um, asks if he could take the dress to a dressmaker to have some improvements made. And he agrees and says that um, this will mean that the wife won't recognise it if she sees Erotium wearing it in the street. Erotium goes indoors and Sosicles says that he will join her in a second after he's spoken to Messenio. Messenio tries to warn him, but Sosicles dismisses him, saying that he has captured a prize. Um, this is praeda in the Latin word um, for prize. It literally means booty, so we've got military metaphors again. He then tells Messenio to go and find a billet for the men, and then meet him back at Erotium's house before sunset. After dismissing another warning from Messenio, Sosicles goes into the house. Messenio extends the pirate ship metaphor, saying that it is going to destroy their own little boat. Then he calls himself a fool for expecting to be able to control his master. He and the other slaves leave with the baggage. An hour or two later, Paniculus returns from town. He says that, in a, in a soliloquy, he just was involved in a public meeting, and it was the stupidest thing he's ever done. While he was there, he assumes that Menachemus slipped off to go back to his mistress without him. He condemns public meetings, simply for wasting the time of busy people, there should be a core of idle men, purely for that business. There are plenty of men who don't need more than one meal a day and never get invited out to eat, who could spend their time on such committees. 
If this were the case, he'd never have lost his lunch today. Um, since it's a typical parasitist, everything goes back to food. He decides to go to Erotium's house anyway, in case there are leftovers. The door opens and Sosicles is about to come out, carrying the dress and wearing a garland on his head. Thinking he's been like Miss, here we have the third case of mistaken identity, Paniculus decides to eavesdrop to find out what he's up to, and then go and speak to him. Sosicles tells Erotium to go and sleep. There's a good girl. The accepted sexism, it wouldn't shock or surprise the audience, and they'd be more surprised if he appeared to respect her. So he tells her to go and sleep while he gets the dress cleared and altered. I think he means cleaned. I think I meant cleaned there, sorry. <laughs> um, Paniculus is pissed that he has eaten all the food, and he vows to get even. Sosicles comes out and addresses the gods. He is grateful and surprised to be granted lunch, drinks, sex, and a prize of a dress which he fully intends to steal. Paniculus tells the audience that he can't quite hear what Sosicles is saying. Sosicles summarises, um, again, this is necessary for Roman comedy due to competing distractions, so he summarises what just happened. Erotium said that he stole the dress from his wife and he agreed, even though he knew it was false. I never had a better, a better time at less expense. Paniculus decides to confront him, angrily accusing him of sneaking away into town, etc. Sorry, sneaking away from him in town. Sosicles tells him that he has no idea who he is, but he will still punish him for such impudence. This confusion continues. Sosicles asks Paniculus' name, and Paniculus refuses in anger. Paniculus tries to wake him up, and then he asks him if he stole that dress from his wife to give to Erotium. And Sosicles says that he has no wife and did none of those things. Paniculus swears that he saw Sosicles coming out of his house that morning wearing the gown. Sosicles says that they are not all pansies like you, which is a homophobic humour, again, typical in this sort of society. It's um, Even though homosexuality was actually kind of accepted, it just happened. You weren't supposed to end up with someone you're... Yeah, well, a man wasn't supposed to end up with a man in um, Roman society, but they did sleep together, so... The homosexual humour here is probably less a dig at homosexuality and more just a joke. Um, because, you know, it is a thing. So Sicilius tells him to get certified as a lunatic. Paniculus decides to go and tell the wife everything as revenge. So Paniculus now conforms to the Parasitus character. He is only out for his own gain. Paniculus goes into Panicus's house, while Sosicles wonder why every wonders why everyone is intent on making a fool of him. A maid comes out of Erotium's house and says that Erotium wants him to take a bracelet to the jewellers to add an ounce of gold, and so it can be remodelled. Um, Sosicles says that he will do anything else she wants me to do. Anything she wants. Again, we've got a double entendre here. The maid says that he must remember the bracelet because he stole it from his wife's chest a mile ago, but Sosicles denies this. Here we have the fourth case of mistaken identity. The maid says that if he doesn't recognise it, he'd better give it back to her. So Sosicles says that of course he remembers it. Obviously he's intent on stealing this too. He then asks where the armlets that he gave Erotium at the same time are. He's pushing his luck. Um, and the maid says that there never were any armlets. Sosicles agrees with her and promises to return the dress and bracelet at the same time. So, situation comedy here. He is taking advantage of the situation in order to gain money and sex. Um, this is a kind of subversion of the typical adolescent's character. So, both twins are the adolescents, which is like the male hero, when in fact they're both quite morally corrupt in a way. They're not horrendous, but, you know, Sosicles is lying and cheating his way to get free sex and, and to steal things. It's not a good thing to do. So yeah, they're subverting the typical character um, of the adolescents. The maid asks if he would get her some gold earrings made. He says that he would gladly if she gave him the gold. She says that she, that she thought he would provide the gold and that she would pay him back later. And he says that she should provide it and he'll pay her back with interest. They're paying him back later. She doesn't mean in gold. She means in sexual favours, a bit of innuendo. She says that she doesn't have any gold, and so he says that he will get the earrings made when she has some. The maid goes into the house. Sosicles, now talking to the audience, 
says that he will get the dress and bracelet sold ASAP. He then praises the gods for their good grace. He's intent to get away from the den of vice and gets rid of his garland. He goes to find Mycenae. This is an ironic phrase to use, as he is the one who lied and cheated his way into getting free food, sex and goods. Panicius um, and Menachus' wife come out of the neighbouring house, and the wife um, is complaining about having to put up with her husband stealing her possessions to give to his mistress. They look in... Sorry, Paniculus says that she is about to catch him red-handed, pointing out the garland that Sosicles threw onto the floor as evidence. They look in the opposite direction to that taken by Sosicles and see Menachmus. This is the fifth case of mistaken identity. Obviously, it is Menachmus, and they think it's Menachmus, but they think that the things he said are things that Sosicles actually said, so it's still a mistaken identity. Paniculus notes that he doesn't have the gown with him, the pair hide in an alley and so that they can hear over here Menachmus. Menachmus, in a soliloquy, criticises the boring custom of patronage. He says that everyone wants to have a large following of quiet clients, whether or not the clients are dishonest. A rich robe, rogue is considered a better client than an honest pauper, even though he will deny his debts and make money through usury and perjury. So this is like being a loan shark. He has just been to court, prevented from doing anything else all day because he had to defend a client for countless crimes. He had just managed to reach a settlement and have both parties agree when his client demanded a guarantor. The man was stupid because there were three witnesses for each crime he was accused of. He curses the man for wasting a day and curses himself for going to the forum that morning. He wasted a good lunch and my, my mistress no doubt anxiously waiting me. This is dramatic irony, because clearly she's been having her own fun with Sosicles. Um, unless his gifts of a gown, um, gifts, sorry, unless his gifts of a gown stolen from his wife had placated her. Obviously, the wife is overhearing this, so she is angry to hear confirmation of the theft. The wife says that he's going to pay interest on the gown he stole. Oh, sorry, I'm I'm skipping things out. Malachmus says that the best thing would be to go and join the party now. Paniculus comes out from hiding and says that he is going to have a bad time now. The wife says that he is going to pay interest on the gown he stole. He says that he has no idea what she's talking about and tries to take her hand. She tells him to get his hands off her and Paniculus eggs her on. Malachmus denies stealing the robe. They refer to it as a wrap and then Paniculus says, You look as if you'd taken the wrap, which is a lovely good old pun and tells him off for eating the lunch behind his back. Menachemus makes hands signals to Paniculus, telling him to shut up. Paniculus tells the wife that Menachemus is trying to silence him with winks, and Menachemus denies this, swearing by Jupiter and the gods. Paniculus says that they should go back to the dressmakers to get the gown back. Menachemus asks, Menachemus asks what gown? Sorry, the names are very wordy. It's difficult to say them in quick repetition. Um... The wife is too upset to reply, crying. Menachemus asks her why she is unhappy. Maybe one of the servants was troublesome, or have been answering her back. He says that he will have them punished. She calls him stupid three times until he realises that she may be upset with him. But he says he has done absolutely nothing wrong. He tries to fondle her, and Paniculus tells the wife that Menachemus is only now trying to play the sweet hubby. Menachemus tells her... Um, tells him to mind his own business, and the wife t t um, tells him to get his hands off her. Paniculus mentions the lunch again, and Menachemus swears that he didn't eat any lunch. Paniculus says that he just saw him on the street with a wreath on his head, claiming that he didn't know who Paniculus was, and Men Menachemus says that he hasn't seen him all day. Menachemus asks the wife what Paniculus told her, and after a while of more confusion, she says that Menachemus stole her dress. Menachemus wonders who could have stolen it, and the wife says that the thief's name was Menachemus, a.k.a. him. Obviously, he genuine. this isn't confusion, he genuinely does know that he stole the dress, but he's trying to get away, um, he's trying to pretend that he doesn't know to get away with it. Paniculus says that Menachemus gave this dress to Erotium, and the wife agrees. Paniculus says um, that they, they can... They can bring an owl to keep repeating, you, you, because they're tired of saying it now. Um, 
in Latin, you is two, and an L makes a sound like two twos. Basically, they're, they're saying, he did it, you did it, Michaelis, you did it. And he keeps denying it, and Paniculus is getting annoyed at this repetition. Aren't we all Paniculus? Paniculus <laughs> um, says that he only lent the dress to a rotium, and the wife says that it's a woman's place to lend out women's clothes, and a man's the men's. She then tells him to bring it back, and he agrees. She says that he's not allowed um, back into the house until he has the gown with him. Obviously, as a woman in you know, this society, she has no authority to say this. It is more of a threat um, of her anger than an enforceable order. But as she is a typical Uxor, it's unlikely that he's going to want to re-enter without having the dress to please her, because obviously she's quite angry in her characterization anyway. Paniculus is frustrated by this response, and he leaves to go to town, and as he is no longer a friend of this family. Monachmus says, in a soliloquy, that he will be welcome at Orotium's house, so his wife has not won. He decides to go there, beg her for the gown back, by telling her that he will buy her a better one. Orotium asks who's there, and then, seeing it's Monachmus, tells him to come in. He says that he wants to tell her what he's come for first, and she assumes it's for sex. Let's be honest, she's a prostitute. They don't need much else. Um, I mean, not prostitutes. I mean, when when um, Malachmus comes to visit her, they don't do much else. He says that his wife has found out everything and he needs the dress back, but will buy her one that is worth twice as much. Erotium says that she has just given it to him. And here we have the sixth case of mis- mistaken identity. Um, giving it back to him to take to the dressmaker and a bracelet for the jeweller. Monachmus denies doing such a thing, saying that after seeing her that morning, he went straight to town and has only just returned. Rotium thinks he's trying to trick her to keep the objects to sell, and he denies it. She says that she never asked for the dress in the first place. It was his idea, and he's welcome to keep it, wear it himself, or give back to his wife. She doesn't care. However, if this is all he thinks of her, he is not welcome back in her house, unless he has some ready money in his hand. She then goes back into the house. He calls after her, begging her to come back. So now he is locked out of both houses, and no one will believe his story at either one. He goes to town to find a friend for advice. Later, Sosicles returned from town with the gown, saying that he was a fool to leave Mesenio with the purse, because he'll probably be in some grog shop, aka a cheap bar or liquor store. The wife looks out of her house and sees him with the dress. The seventh case of mistaken identity. So she comes out to him, calling him a sinner and asking if he's ashamed. He is surprised and asks her what's wrong. She is shocked that he's still daring to bandy words with her. He asks if he's committed any crime and she is angry that he is still asking that. He asks her if she's ever heard why the Greeks used to call Hecuba a bitch. She was the Queen of Troy, wife of Priam, and in the Iliad, if you watch my Iliad summary, that she's in there. And he says it's because she used to pour abuse on anyone she came across, like the wife is doing now. She says she'd rather live and die without a husband than endure his behaviour. And he asks why this is any of his concern. She vows to get a divorce, um, and he, sorry, says that he has no objection to that. Obviously, he doesn't know who she is, she's not his wife, he doesn't care what she does. She says that he denied stealing the gown an hour ago, and now is holding it right in front of her. He asks if she honestly claims the dress is hers because it was given to him by another woman to take to the repairers. She says to send us, um, she sends a slave, Decio, to bring her father urgently, um, and then she will expose all of Sosicles's, meaning Monachmus's obviously, evil practices, stealing clothes and jewels from her to give to his mistress. He asks if she has any medicine to help him swallow her insults because he knows no more of her than he does of Hercules' grandfather-in-law. This man was called Porthon, I think is how you phrase it. Um, But he's a very obscure character, is the point being made. She sees her father coming and points him out. Sosicles says that he knows him as well as Calchas, um, blind seer, i.e. he'd have to be a seer to know a stranger. Um, the wife's father appears, but as he assumed to be at a distance away, he moans, and this is called the Senex's song. Oh gosh, the... Okay, well, we'll just leave that. Um, this, is his, this is his moan. He's coming as fast as an old man can. 
He's older, so more weight to carry and less strength. Age only brings troubles. He criticises his daughter for calling him out to sort out another quarrel with her husband. Women with a good dowry behind them are horrible. Um, basically, his idea is that women with a good dowry think they can call the shots because their husband needs that money. Realistically, um, the father is saying, no, they don't. Husbands aren't always blameless, and a woman doesn't send for her father without good reason. So basically, this father is typical of the patriarchy. He tends to favour the side of the man, in, even though it is his daughter who is complaining to him. He beckons her to her to talk to him alone first. He says it's good to see her and asks why she looks so downcast and why her husband looks so grumpy. He asks whose fault their fight is. She says that she's done nothing wrong but cannot live with him any longer. She says that she's being treated like dirt by her husband. Then her father says that he's told her before not to come with him, come to him with her complaints. She asks how she can avoid it, and he says that to try to please her husband rather than spy on everything he does. She says that he's been with a harlot, and her father says that he doesn't blame him because of the way she is treating him. She says he's been drinking there too, and her father says that she has no right to stop him from drinking. She may as well expect him to be her slave and do the housework, etc. She is upset that he is on her husband's side, but he says that her husband keeps her comfortably, with clothes, jewellery and servants, and so she should just accept it. This is a very masculine view, obviously. She says that he has been stealing these clothes and jewels to give to his mistress, which her father agrees is wrong. Then she says he currently has a gown and bracelet which he had given to Erotium, and is now only bringing back because she found out. The father decides to hear the truth from Anikmus, a.k.a. Sosicles, and asks him. Here we have the eighth case of mistaken identity. Sosicles says that he doesn't know who the old gentleman is, but swears that he's never done anything wrong to the wife, and she says he's lying. Sosicles says that he's damned if he ever entered that house. The father is shocked that Sosicles curses himself, saying that Sosicles is lying unless he moved out of the house yesterday. He asks the wife if they moved house, and she says no. She says that Sosicles is clearly joking, and the father tells him to stop. <laughs> Sosicles maintains that he doesn't know who they are or where they come from, but the wife has done nothing but insult him since he met her. The wife says that his eyes and face are turning green in madness. Aside, Sosicles says that he may as well pretend to be insane to frighten them off, and so he acts accordingly. This is visual humour. The father tells the wife to come away from Sosicles, while Sosicles raves. Ehu, ehu, Bacchus ahoy! I am watched by a witch, a wild female bitch, and behind her a smelly old goat. Um, so it's like it sounds like he's pretending to be Pentheus in Euripides' Bacchae, who was possessed by the gods. Um, he mistakes people for animals, so he's calling the woman a f female dog, a bitch, and her father um, a smelly old goat. The Bacchant religion had a growing following in Plautus' time, but was still regarded as weird. So this is a kind of topical illusion, but topical illusions aren't really big in Roman comedy anyway. This continues, farce, um, until the father decides to get some servants to carry him home and tie him up. Hearing this, Sosicles goes to attack the wife so that they don't carry him off immediately, and the wife escapes into the house. Sosicles says that he's got rid of her, and now for the old Tithonus. Um, this was a titan who was given immortality when he married Aurora, but no eternal youth, so he's bas basically he's the symbol for being very, very, very old. Um, a so-called son of Cygnus. This was a swan, so it's either, either to refer to um, the white hair of the father, or a pun in Greek meaning bitch father. Either way, he's being offensive. So he pretends that Apollo is inspiring him to attack the father. This farce continues, with the father getting more and more scared, until they grapple and Sosicles falls to the ground. The father decides that he must be having a stroke, because he was sane a few minutes before, so he hurries off to get a doctor. Sosicles plans um, to get back to this ship while the father and wife are away, and then asks the audience not to tell the father which way he went. This is probably... Plautus' audition, um, addition sorry, to the original Greek play. Later, the father returns, tired from waiting for the doctor to get back from his rounds. Tells me he had set a broken leg for Aeschylus... 
Esculapius. I feel like I've spelled that wrong. Anyway, um, who's a god of healing, and made an arm for Apollo, who was a god of medicine and the father of Esculapius. The doctor, um, the anonymity of his title is unsurprising. Doctors were just doctors. Um, also, this is the only com- comic doctor, Medicus, in surviving Roman comedy. However, in Greek new comedy, doctors were the butt of many jokes. They were a stock character because people didn't have to be trained to be a doctor and so they were often quite stupid and a bit wacky. So the doctor comes and asks what the nature of the illness is. The father says he wants the doctor to find out and cure him. They see Menachemus coming and stand aside to observe his behaviour. This is the ninth case of mistaken identity. Menachemus is complaining about Paniculus exposing his schemes, comparing him to Ulysses. This is Odysseus, um, synonymous with cunning. He says that he will put an end to Paniculus's life, although it's really his life since Paniculus has been living on his money and food. Um, he then says that Erotium behaved just as you would expect a um, prostitute to act, stock character, mercenary, meritrix, um, obviously refusing to return the gown. The doctor says that Menachemus sounds like an unhappy creature. Urged on by the father, the doctor goes and speaks to Menachemus. He says that his arm shouldn't be uncovered, because that's the worst possible thing for his complaint. Menachemus tells him to go and hang himself. This would have been the most scandalous of jokes in Roman comedy. The father asks if he um, notices anything, and the doctor says he does. It'll take bushels of hellebore to get the better of this malady. And this was a potion used for madness. He asks Menachemus if he drinks white wine or red. Um, so according to Brown, a scholar, most Roman wine was amber, and so red or white would have been a ridiculous question and it would have been to test his madness. Menachemus dismisses him again, and the doctor tells the father that the fit is definitely coming on him again. Menachemus asks why the doctor doesn't ask if he eats pink, purple or yellow bread, or birds with scales and fish with feathers, etc. Obviously, he's thinking that the doctor is being mad. The father asks if the doctor can give him something to stop him from going completely mad, and the doctor says he will soon. The doctor asks if Menachemus ever feels his eyes scaling over, and Menachemus is pissed off again. The doctor asks if he's noticed any bowel rumbling, and Menachemus says they only rumble when he's empty. The doctor asks if he sleeps all night and whether he falls asleep easily. Menachemus says that he sleeps well if he's paid all his bills, and then curses the doctor and his silly questions. The doctor says that this shows the madness coming on again. The father says that he is, to- um, that he is talking as sanely as Nestor compared to what he was a while ago when he called his wife a crazy bitch. Um, this is in the Iliad, it's Agamemnon's advisor, a sage old diplomat. So, um, synonymous with sanity and wise um yeah um here is a plot inconsistency it is highly likely that the twins would have been wearing di- oh i've mentioned this but they're wearing different outfits so although in roman comedy they'd actually both have been wearing the red adolescent's dress and mask if this was a real situation they probably would have been wearing different clothes um so the plot inconsistency Menachemus is surprised as he has no recollection of this the father says that he can bring eyewitness evidence of Menachemus' madness against him, and Menachemus says that he can prove that the father stole the sacred crown off Jupiter's head and were put in prison for it. This was a Greek proverbial insult. Um, you thief of what is holy, so it's blasphemy. Um, so also, these are more ridiculous accusations. The father tells the doctor to do something quickly, and the doctor advises having him brought to the doctor's house so that he can supervise treatment. The doctor tells Menachemus that he will put him on hellebore for three weeks, and Menachemus says, I'll put you onto a rack and have you pricked with goads for a month. Obviously, he's getting angry. (laughs) The doctor tells the father to get at least four men to bring him to the house. The father goes to do this and asks the doctor to keep an eye on him, but the doctor needs to go home to make preparations. Alone, um, in a soliloquy, Menachemus wonders why they think he's insane. He doesn't know what to do because his wife won't let him go home and Erotium won't let him in her house. He decides to wait there and hope that someone will let him in at nightfall, sitting down at his doorstep. Messenio comes from the town, 
saying that it is the mark of a good slave to always look after his master's welfare, attending to his business when he's absent, etc. Any slave should look after his back and chins, rather than his stomach, because they'll remember what punishments idle slaves get. Floggings, chains, the treadmill, starving, freezing. Um, this is an insight into the life of a slave. Um, obviously, this wasn't written by a slave, we think, so not necessarily accurate, but it's pr probably what genuinely what genuine punishments were for slaves in this time. So that's why he's decided to be a good slave. He can bear being shouted at and snapped at more than getting whipped. The way to be a useful slave is to be afraid of trouble, even when you've done no wrong. His master will reward him for his service soon. He says he's done everything Sosicles asks. Set all the slaves and baggage at an inn and return to meet him. So he decides to knock at the door and rescue him from the den of thieves. As he goes to a rotium store, the father returns with four slaves. The father repeats his orders to the slave. This scene is called the assault. Um, the orders are to pick and carry Menachemus to the doctor's house, unless they want to be punished, and to not take any notice of Menachemus' threats. He then goes to the doctor's house. The slaves grapple with Menachemus and he shouts for help, saying that he is being attacked. The senior sees Menachemus, Thinking he is Sosicles, here we have the tenth case of mistaken identity, and so he goes to tell the slaves to drop him. Menachemus thinks a stranger has come to his aid and thanks him. Mesenio agree, uh, agrees and encourages Menachemus to fight the slaves. Um, this is not a proper fight, it's more choreographed and comic than that. And it's farce. Sorry, Mesenio attacks the slave until they stop grabbing Menachemus. Then Menachemus blesses him by the gods, saying that saying aside that he has no idea who he is. Um, Messenio asks for his freedom. Slaves could be set free in extreme circumstances, for example, long service, in a will, or saving your master's life. And obviously Messenio thinks it's so sickly, so he thinks that this person has the power to set him free. Um, and Monachus is surprised, swearing by Jupiter that Messenio isn't one of his servants. Jupiter is the top part of Familius, um, and so it is fitting that Menachemus swears by him when talking about manumission. Mesenio is puzzled a bit, and then asks if he's no longer a servant of Menachemus, um, whether he can go free, and Menachemus agrees. Mesenio says, Hail, one-time master, now my patron. Um, this is again patronage, so once freed, you automatically became a client of your ex-master. Mesenio shakes hands with himself, congratulating himself on his freedom. He then tells Menachemus that he wants to go on living with him and have orders the same way as he always did. Menachemus says that this isn't happening. Messenio says that he will go to collect the baggage and his purse to bring back. And Menachemus says that he's welcome to do that, smirking. Um, this is a similar reaction to Sosicles being given free pleasures by Rotium. And then I say Menachemus leaves, but I'm pretty sure it's Messenio who leaves. Yeah, it is. I, I just wrote the wrong name. Sorry. So Messenio leaves. Menachemus, in a soliloquy, says that it is a day of wonder, summarising what has just happened. He decides to call on Erotium again to see if he can get his wife's dress back. He knocks on the door and is admitted. Mesenio hasn't gone far when he bumps into Sosicles. Sosicles asks him if he has the impudence to say that he's met him any other time today. Mesenio says that he just rescued him from four men. The eleventh case of mistaken identity. As I said, the Roman comedy is very repetitive. He saved his life and was granted freedom. Um, then went get back to get the money. Meanwhile, Sosicle, it appears, took a shortcut to intercept him and pretend that this never happened. So basically, Messenio thinks that Sosicles is trying to get out of setting Messenio free. Sosicle says that he never gave him his freedom and would rather become a slave himself than set him free. Menachemus comes out of Rotium's house. This is the recognition scene. It's kind of like the denouement. Um, and shouts back to someone within that he has not taken the gown and raced it away, calling the women bitches. Messenio sees Menachemus and tells Sosicles that he sees his double, as like as two peas. Menachemus sees Messenio and tells him that whoever he is, he is his preserver. Messenio asks for his name and Menachemus gives it. Sosicles says that this, this is his name. So they're realising they have the same name. This, by the way, this recognition scene, you would expect 
that as Sosicles has come to find his twin brother, he would be on the lookout for someone that looks identically like him. However, they take ages to realise that they are twins and that they're... It's very frustrating. Okay, so they realise they have the same name. Then Monachmus says that he is a Sicilian from Syracuse. And Sosicles says that this is his hometown. Wow. Um, they are both surprised and Messinio is very confused. Aside, he says that Monachmus is his master. Twelfth case of mistaken identity. He then tells Monachmus this and tells Sosicles that he was mistaken. Sosicles then says that he arrived in Epidamnus with Messenio this morning. And so then Messenio says, oh, you must be my master then. He turns to Monachmus saying that he'll have to find another slave and greets Sosicles, introducing him as Monachmus. I'm sorry, this is very, it's a farce, but it's very confusing, so I, I hope it makes sense. I try to use a lot of the names regularly to make it clear who I was talking about who, but it's, it's quite weird to write down. Monachmus says that his name is Monachmus, son of Motius, and Sosicles says that that is his name and his father. Aside, Senio says that these must be twins. Dramatic irony. He calls Monachmus, meaning his master, Sosicles, and they both answer. And so he says, whichever one he came to Epidamnus with this morning. Senio calls Sosicles forward and says that Monachmus must be either an imposter or his twin, and that they must go and ask him more questions. In Latin, this was sycophant, literally translated as actor. So this is a bit of irony, um, linguistic irony. Messenio says that um, that's a good idea, and if it is his twin, oh, I, I'm sorry, I've completely screwed this end up. Monachmus says that that's a good idea, and if it is his twin, Messenio is a free man. Messenio turns to Monachmus and confirms his name, then says that Sosicles' name is Monachmus too. They were both born in Syracuse, and both their fathers were Motius. He says that he thinks they are twin brothers, and Monachmus says it sounds like a miracle. Messenio asks them both their names. Again, very repetitive. We've gone through the name thing, but okay, it happens again. And they both say Monachmus. He asks their father, and they both say Motius. Then he asks their nationality, and they both say Syracusan. He asks about their life at home. Monachmus says that his father took him to Tarentum on a business trip, and then he got kidnapped. Sosicles calls to Jupiter in surprise, but Messenio tells him to be quiet. Messenio asks Monachmus how old he was when this happened, and he says seven. Messenio asks how many sons his father had at the time, and Monachmus says two, and that they were twins. Sosicles interrupts again and is told off again. Messenio asks whether he and his twin were given the same name, and Monachmus says that they weren't. His brother was called Sosicles. Sosicles says that he cannot refrain any longer and embraces Monachmus, his twin. Monachmus asks how he now has a different name, and Sosicles says that their grandfather changed it after Monachmus went missing. Monachmus asks Sosicles what their mother's name was, and Sosicles says, Tuximarca. They both now accept they are twins and they rejoice. Messenia says that this must be why Erotium offered Sosicles lunch today, and Monachmus says that he did indeed arrange lunch with his mistress and gave her his wife's gown. Sosicles hold up the dress and asks if it was that one. He says that Monachmus's mistress gave him the gown after lunch, and then he says he enjoyed himself with the woman. Monachmus says that he is delighted to have put good luck in his way. This is an insight into Roman views. There seems to be no issue with sharing a mistress with your brother, which I feel like in this day of age would be a little bit odd um, and would be frowned upon in many social circles. Um, but obviously in Roman times, this seems to be absolutely fine. No one questions it. Messenio asks if the offer of freedom still holds, and Monachmus agrees, and asks Sosicles to grant it for his sake. Sosicles agrees. So this is the typical ending for the service Kalidus. Monachmus congratulates him on, the f on his freedom, and then Messenio thanks them. Aside, he says that he'll need more congratulations to remain a free man for life. Sorry, more than congratulations, so basically he's going to need money and stuff. Sosicles asks Monachmus if they should return home together, and Monachmus says that he'd be happy to, as soon as he has auctioned his property in Epidamnus. Messenio asks, asks to be their auctioneer, and Monachmus agrees. Messenio then announces, kind of to the audience, but just to whoever's around, the auction in a week's time. Sale will include slaves, household effects, house, land, etc. 
and a wife, should there be any purchaser. So women were property. Fun, fun fact. Confidentially to the audience, he says he doubts the whole lot would get more than 50,000. Um, so he's, again, the service card us, he's taken the mick. He says farewell to the audience and calls for applause. Again, this is a typical ending. They ask for applause um, to show that the ending has happened. So the bad guys don't get the comeuppance in the end. Um, oh, I've, I said done. I mean don't. Yeah, the end of this has been a bit shambles, but, <laughs> but it's happened. Um, Sosocles and Monikamus were immoral throughout the play, but they end up happy anyway. Um, so this leads us to question... Um, is comedy supposed to be moral and present moral ideas? Greek comedy was clearly a lot more likely to do that, but in Roman comedy, these, you know, um, Sosicles and like us were immoral and they end up together and happy and selling the wife, who actually, in reality, hasn't done anything wrong. Yes, she's been a bit of a spy, but, you know, she hasn't done anything illegal or immoral. And yet she ends up sad. Okay, thank you for watching. Um, I hope this was helpful. I hope you stuck with it. Obviously, I don't enjoy this one. Hopefully you did maybe a little bit more than me. Um, yeah, and I'll be doing more soon. Thank you.